um, appeal to Assyria for help against Syria to join them. Then he invited Ahaz to call upon the Lord for a sign to confirm the prophetic word. But you know what? The unfaithful king, having already decided to place his test, trust in the Lord, and not in the Lord, but in Assyria. In response to Ahaz's refusal to trust God, Isaiah proclaimed once again, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of human beings? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Well, shortly after that, Assyria and Israel were soundly defeated and exactly as Isaiah had prophesied. Many years later, the southern kingdom of Judah was destroyed by Babylon and they took their people captive. The sign given hundreds of years earlier to an apostate king was meant for all God's people because in Matthew, when we turn there this morning, in Matthew 1, 23, we see that prophecy come to life. Matthew 1, 23, you've heard it many times. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Let us bow our heads for a quick word of prayer this morning. Father, I'm thankful for this Christmas message in July, Father. It's the greatest message of all time. And Lord, I pray for these few moments that we're together, Lord, that you bring clarity through uh, as I try to communicate what you want to be heard this morning, Father. We love you and we worship you, and it's all about you this morning. Thank you for Emmanuel. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Over this past week, I was looking at... Uh, I'm home quite a bit more as I'm kind of semi-retired right now. So I put in uh, to the Google search, uh, most influential people to the world. I wanted to know who that was. It's amazing some of the names they pull out. Uh, but I, I went with one list that was topyaps.com. Never heard of it before, but I was there this past week. I'm going to list the five most important people that they listed on this website. Number five is probably no surprise to you. It's Albert Einstein. He was one of the greatest of all physicists of all times. So without saying. Number four, I understand why it's there, but it bothered me. It was Adolf Hitler. He changed things, but not necessarily for the good. We know Adolf Hitler was Germany's leader uh, from 1933 to 1945, and he led the most devastating war in history. Millions of Jews were uh, uh, killed due to his hand uh, involved with wanting a blue-eyed, blonde-haired master race to lead the world. Number three, Mouse, Nelson, <laughs> easy for me to say, Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Number two, Martin Luther King. We know who Martin is. Number one is the one that kind of threw me for a loop. Bill Gates made the number one list on Top Yaps. Uh, he created his first computer uh, while he was still in high school, co-founded Microsoft in 1977, and by 1993 was the richest man on earth. We know that, that those discoveries have changed the way we live. But you know what kind of just blows me away? Is to look at that list of top ten, and I didn't see Emmanuel on there. I didn't see Jesus on there. Some of the lists I do want to tell you did include Jesus, but this list excluded him. And he, I mean, this was God, fully man, incarnate, God incarnate that came to earth, God with us. And the greatest message that we have today is God is with us. Amen. Today I want us to take hold of these three words. Don't take them for granted because there's a lot of riches, there's a lot of truth, there's a lot contained in those three words. And in a day like we have today in July in 2020, we need this message. God is with us. So what does the verse from Matthew mean when it says his name is Emmanuel? Well, I think Paul told us a little bit about this in Hebrews 4.15 when he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet is without sin. The joy, the hope, the strength, the solace that comes from Matthew 1.23 is not that God just came to earth and dwelt in a flesh body and was close to man for a while, it's not even the great promise that in the Holy Spirit, God is present with us today. No, the exciting thing is that he is with me. He understands me. He can identify with me. He can sympathize with my hurts, my weaknesses, my fears. I find great strength 
in reading John eleven thirty five 35, that Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He cried. Because I know he can identify with my broken heart when I lose a loved one. He's with me. I like Matthew 8, where he's visiting a disciple's house, Peter's house. In verse 14 of chapter 8 of Matthew, it says, And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose again and began to serve him. That evening they brought many to him who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah again. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. God's word says he took on himself our infirmities and bore our uh, diseases. Why? So he could identify with our sickness and how it feels to be sick. He has compassion. He's with us. I'm saddened, but I'm grateful that Jesus knew what it felt like to be betrayed by a close friend. He was even abandoned by the 12 disciples, God's word tells us in Mark 14, 50. He can be with me in my times of abandonment. I'm glad Jesus was hated for doing the right thing. I needed him to be with me in my trials. Jesus had to deal with the hardheads too. We look at the Pharisees in the New Testament, and we're talking some real religious hardheads. Who were they? were closed-minded. They didn't want to see something new. Jesus knew what it was like. Having the great, almighty, majestic, creator, sustainer of the universe right beside me with all the power and strength captures my heart because he understands my needs and weaknesses, and he understands yours. I'm glad that Jesus was rejected by his friends. I'm glad Jesus was afraid to go to the cross. I'm glad that Jesus knew what it was to have too little time and too much to do. I'm glad because I know he can understand how I feel. I'm glad God is with us this morning. Isaiah 43, 2 is one of my favorite verses, and I invite you to turn there this morning. You may not be familiar with it. It's Isaiah 43, 2, and it reads, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you, When you walk ablaze through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. That's a wonderful verse. It's a wonderful promise. But you know, in my Christian walk, I'm going to be very honest with you. There's times that I haven't wanted to pass through the waters. I haven't wanted to. I've wanted there to be a big old bridge over the top of it. I like bridges looking down at the water going underneath me. But you know what? There are no promises of bridges. He says, when you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you when you go through that turbulent water. Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite pastors from the 19th century, had some commentary on this, and I love it. I have to share it with you. He reads uh, about Isaiah 43, 2. He says, bridge there is none. We must go through the waters and feel the rush of the rivers. The presence of God in the flood is better than a ferry boat. Tried we must be. Triumphant we shall be. For Jehovah himself, who is mightier than many waters, shall be with us. Emmanuel. Amen. The promise of Scripture is, I not only have someone who is with me that understands and feels my pain, but I have someone who can do something about that pain. There's one God Almighty. I don't have somebody just with me this morning. I have God, the all-powerful creator of heaven and earth, the one who's made everything. The, power God who, the powerful God who made a way for the children of Israel to walk through the Red Sea. In this situation, he decided they didn't have to walk in the turbulent storm. He parted the waters. I love that scene in the old movie, um, The Ten Commandments, where the sea parts. I mean, it just gives, makes what few hairs I have stand up. powerful God who delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. You see those three fellows and they come out, they don't even smell like smoke. Same powerful God who allowed Gideon's 300 men to destroy the Philistine army. The same powerful God who shut the mouths of the hungry lions and delivered Daniel. We have a God who understands this and more than that, he can do something about it, about our need. 
That brings us to the two-letter word this morning, U.S., us. I get great encouragement from reading passages like Hebrew 11. It's 40 verses, and with it, it tells the stories of 18 Bible greats and how God was with them in their time of trouble and how God displayed his awesome power on their behalf. Just a few Enoch who did not die because God took him home alive. Noah, who experienced the awesome delivery from the flood. Abraham became the father of all uh, the Jewish nation and all believers. Sarah gave birth in her 90s. Now, there's one for you. Joseph, who was sent from the dungeon to the throne. His brothers put him in the dungeon. Mm. Moses, who did incredible things in the ten plagues. They give us strength to look at that. I'm glad it's in God's word. But then the thought comes to me, and I'm going to be honest, it's just me maybe. But wait a minute, those were the saints. Those are the super believers. Those are the spiritual giants that are contained within this book. I don't have that kind of faith sometimes. Sometimes I don't. Put me in those same situations and I'll fold like an old lawn chair. They had, even faith, they had faith even when it didn't rain, when loved ones died, there was no money or food even, when everything was lost, like for Job. We're kind of going all over the Bible here. We've got these people. But, you know, there's times I don't respond that way. Maybe you don't either. I sometimes have real doubts and fears. I don't always stand uh, firm and unshakable. I want to. I can, I, sure, I can understand why God was with them and did powerful things, but I'm not one of them. If there's a roll call of the week, the not super, the not so saintly, my, my name's going to be on there. But i got to tell you something this morning. That's what I love about the two-letter word us. God is with us. It doesn't say God is with Moses. God is with the super saints. God is with us this morning. Amen. He's with us. And that's a promise. It's not just something on a t-shirt. It's his promise to us. He's unshakable. He will not back off of his word. This verse excites me. It means you and me this morning in the 21st century. I'm excited about that. The little people, the Christians that struggle from day to day, God Almighty creator of the universe, the one who traced the rivers with his finger on this earth and healed the afflicted that we talked about, this God is with us, identifies with us, and with me. Romans 5.8 clarifies that for us this morning. It reads, God commended his love to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I have a God who knows my every need, my weaknesses, my fears, and insufficiencies. And I have a God who can meet my every need and supply my every sufficiency, and that God will be there with me regardless. I'm telling you that today. If you hear this message that Almighty, all-powerful God sees, hears, and knows, and identifies with you, that's something to be excited about. That's the Christmas message in July. I wonder if there's somebody here today spiritually broke. You've tapped out, and you need to, to know that there's hope. You need to believe that there is someone who knows your pain and they can do something about it. I have a word for you this morning. It's Emmanuel. The Gospel of Matthew, and this, this week I just noted that, noticed this. I've read it many times in my close to 60 years. But the Gospel of Matthew opens in the first chapter, Emmanuel, God with us. But if you go to the end of the book, of Matthew in 28. He closes at his ascension. He says, Lo, I am with you always. What does that mean to us? Everything. Warren Wearsby, another pastor and teacher that I really admire, and I got to meet when I was a little fella. He writes, What a tremendous assurance. I'm with you always. In Matthew 1 23, Jesus was called Emmanuel. God with us. And in Matthew 28, 20, he re reaffirms that name. He is with us through the Spirit. He is with us through his word, by his providential care, and with his divine presence. This is a promise that has encouraged and enabled messengers 
of Christ down through the years. Indeed, Emmanuel was God for us before he became God with us. He was for us that he became God with us. God with us allowed Jesus to be crucified as the God-man so that he could be God in us, the hope of glory, as Colossians 1.27 tells us. And he is God in us. Then he is also God for us, as Paul affirms uh, in uh, Scripture, where he says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Amen. 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 In your daily experience, do you know Jesus as Emmanuel? Emmanuel God with you. How is God with you this week? How is God with you today? Many of us are like the children of Israel, perhaps saying, is the Lord among us not in the Exodus? We need to remind ourselves of the truth that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow and forever. Charles Spurgeon once again, I'm sorry, to, but powerful words this man had. What we need even more than deliverance from trouble is a sure knowledge that God is our Emmanuel in the midst of trouble. The secret of peace, he writes, is not a plan or a program, but a person, Emmanuel, God with us. I'm going to say that again. It bears repeating. The secret of peace is not a plan a program or a person, but a, excuse me, but a person, Emmanuel, God with us. This is, this is the tough part of the message this morning, and I could probably skip over it, but I, I feel like we need to talk about it today. A lot of people assume that God is with them. When they drive by the nativities, they look at it and they think that's really awesome, that little baby in Christmas, and we celebrate that baby. It's a beautiful thing. They assume that God is with them without the benefit of really knowing Jesus is in their life personally. You must have Jesus as your Lord and Savior in order for God to really be with you. You can't just assume that God's with you. And here's, here's the message of it all. And I'm preaching this to David Robertson this morning. We've sinned against God. We were born sinners, even those cute little babies. They are born sinners. We were born in sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A few chapters up in Romans 6.23, it says, The wages of sin is it's death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. That means we've offended God and driven him away by our sin. You have to do something about it to get God with you. But here's the story, guys. You can't do anything about it. Can't do a thing. You can't do anything. Because why? It's a gift. It's a gift of God. Eternal life in Christ Jesus. You must have Jesus in order for God to be with you this morning. It's like the smallpox vaccination. Has anybody had, ever had the smallpox vaccination? I think some of us are of an age where we... Do they still give that anymore? I don't know, but... It was discovered in Europe back in the 1800s. For many years, smallpox really was a deadly plague. It killed uh, a third of everyone who caught it. And just before the 1800s, uh, they developed a smallpox vaccination. But, um, and it, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, whoever took it, they would just come down with maybe a mild case, but then they'd be immune. And this was amazing, life-saving innovation. But just imagine after the discovery, someone could go around saying, we're saved, we're saved, we're saved. We got the smallpox vaccination. Uh, we're all going to be saved. And wouldn't they be excited about it? But th that's good news, and everybody should have been excited. But what they need to be sure and realize is it's only good news if they take the vaccination. It's the same thing with Emmanuel, God with us. It's amazing news, folks. We had been driven, we'd driven God away by our sin, and he, was, and he was rightfully against us since we had rebelled against him. But now Jesus has come, Emmanuel, God with us. But just like the good news of the vaccine, it's only good if you actually take the cure. Jesus is the cure this morning. Just like you've got to receive that vaccine into your body, so you must actually receive Jesus into your life to be saved. 
Only then will God really be with you. And you have to receive him in. John 1, 12 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. And when he is, then you can say, sing that old hymn, which I love, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. There's an excerpt from a book of John Ortberg. He was an author that I really enjoyed reading 20 years ago probably. And um, this is an excerpt from his book called God is Closer Than You. He, he's a um, Presbyterian pastor now out in California. And this, um, this reads, it says, A pastor was, was once traveling aboard a plane. A business, businessman sat beside him with a laptop switch on. The screensaver was a picture of a sweet little boy. The pastor got to know that, that was his son, his only child. It was, it was taken three months earlier when the boy was 11 months old. The businessman went on to talk about his son with great excitement. He talked about his first steps, about his first words. He showed the pastor pictures of the boy on the mobile phone and then more pictures from the computer. He displayed them one at a time, giving commentary to each and every picture. The pastor was kind of getting bored with it. Some pictures were, were quite ordinary, he thought. I can't wait to get home with him, the man said. In the meantime, I could look at these pictures many times a day. They never get hold to me. And the pastor was really getting tired of this. <laughs> Why was this man so preoccupied with this boy? Was it because the boy's achievement, achievements were so impressive? No. We have millions of children at his age learned to do the same thing. In fact, the pa pastor kind of felt his own boy looked a lot cuter and could do a lot more than that little boy could. The man was so excited about the child because he looked at him through the eyes of a father. Everything the boy did was seen with wonder and joy, and it did not matter that the other, other children did the same things. That's my boy. The pastor said, you obviously miss your son. How long ago did you leave home? And the man answered, yesterday. One day from his, away from his son was one too many. He wanted to get home fast to be with his boy. He did not want to love his son from a distance. He wanted to be with him. This is my father's heart. This is our heavenly father's heart for you today. We're on God's, screen, God's screensaver, so to speak. <laughs> the tiniest of details of our lives never grow old to him. And the Bible says even the very hairs of your head are all numbered in Matthew 10, 30. God says, I'm with you. This is God's most frequent promise in the Bible. Now, with all that said, to accept Jesus as your personal Savior is to acknowledge who he is to you in your life. It's to believe in him. And John 3, 16 reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the most important message we have today. I'm going to ask that we all bow our heads this morning. Just bow your heads in the quietness of this, this room. I have a couple of questions for you this morning that only you can answer. You don't have to answer them out loud, but I want you to, to, to hear these questions and just meditate on them a little bit. Who is Jesus or Emmanuel to you this morning? Do you know him as your savior? Maybe you do. Praise God. I believe a lot of people do. But you know what? There's some people that don't. And I'm, I'm not here to criticize that. I'm here to tell you the good news. If not, are you willing to place your faith in Jesus Christ as your savior and receive this free gift of eternal life? If so, we can follow through with that decision this morning. In God's word, Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is, in, is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the best news we have this morning, guys. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I remember when my mom was on her deathbed, I asked her what her favorite verse was, and she says, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. 
You see, as you're with your heads bowed, there's no special prayer uh, that you must pray to invite Christ into your heart. However, this morning with our heads bowed, if you'd like to accept Christ as your Savior, I'm going to say a simple prayer which you can use to accept him this morning. And it's as simple as this. Dear God, I realize I am a sinner and can never reach heaven with my own good deeds. Right now, I place my faith in Jesus Christ as God's son who died for my sins, rose from the dead to give me eternal life. Please forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you. Thank you for accepting me and giving me eternal life. If you've prayed this prayer this morning, eternity has been changed forever, and the angels are rejoicing. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. I'm thankful for the Christmas message in July. It was for me, Lord. I needed to be reminded that you are with me, Father. I need to be reminded of the gospel message every day and how invaluable it is to me as a sinful human. Lord, I thank you for the people here this morning, and I just pray that your message has been proclaimed, Father. And, uh, Lord, if anybody has come to know you as Lord and Savior, Father, I'm thankful that we have today a church that we can gather together and encourage one another and learn more about you and be equipped. And, uh, Father, I thank you for your saints that, that surround us today, Lord, and I thank you for the love that you show through us, that they are your hands and your feet, Lord. Um, Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory this morning. Just carry us through and may uh, our continued worship just be uh, sweet to yours. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.